Link Legrand from Legrand Holdings. He's the, the, the Chief Executive Officer and he's here to discuss this Google adding a countdown clock displaying the number of hours left for the Ethereum merge to occur. Link, thanks for joining us here in Talk 100.3. Absolutely, man. Um, probably the biggest event in crypto history since Bitcoin went down this morning. Wow. And all over the world, Google set a countdown for it. Um, amazing to, to see that kind of activity. I was, I've been a speaker on this morning for about three hours as it was happening on Twitter mm -hmm. spaces, day before and the day before that. The entire blockchain community is buzzing and it went off without a hitch. It went completely great. It was amazing. So, so, so run through for anyone who's not quite sure, because we know that Ethereum is, is probably the second major cryptocurrency right. after mm -hmm. Bitcoin. What exactly is this merge and what has it been? Okay, so to make it really simple so that people understand it, if you think about blockchain, what is it? It's an accounting ledger, right? So if I go to my bank, they've got a record of my accounts, but it's one company controls it, right? Mm. So if I go to social media, Facebook has one record of my accounts, but they control it as a central entity. Sure. Blockchain, whether it be Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or any of the other cryptocurrencies, are essentially a ledger system, but they've got a bunch of different people that validate those transactions instead of one entity, right? right. And with Bitcoin, which is kind of where this all started off, they had something called proof of work. So the consensus mechanism was a bunch of these computers that are taking a ton of power. Imagine the Bitcoin network right now takes 150 terawatt hours of power, wow. which is equivalent to Argentina's power. Wow. Ethereum was doing the same thing until today. Uh -huh. And today, Ethereum switched to proof of stake and it dropped 99.95%. So that's a big problem that a lot of mainstream uh, adoption has been a problem with that. And it's it's a big move, but there's a lot of other cool things packed into the merge as well. That's right. I mean, because, you know, there, there were, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh people, especially the ones who were talking about the environment and stuff, and, and they, they had a massive uh, talk about uh, how the cryptocurrencies are actually sucking out all the electricity and thus, uh, you know, uh, it is not a future-ready product. Uh, with this merge happening, it, it answers definitely that one question for sure. But mm. what other questions does this answer? So the second thing that people talk about is on the currency side. At my I mean, I, I deal, I speak a lot of macroeconomics, but... For me, I'm more excited about the technical part of this. I'll mm -hmm. get to that in a second. But one of the big stories right now is the inflation of the currency. So a lot of the other cryptocurrencies, Solana and the and like Avalanche, Algorand, they have about a 10% inflation per year. Mm -hmm. uh, fiat currencies have a much higher inflation than that of per course. year. You know, 15, right. 20%. And in recent years, a lot higher than that. Bitcoin has been around 2 to 3%. And it's it's because of it's it's a stable amount, but it's releasing of the years. Ethereum, prior to today... Uh -huh. was a 4.3% inflation. Okay. Today it dropped 90%. To 0.43%, wow. it's half of Bitcoin's inflation rate. That is phenomenal. And there's a one of they do these thing called upgrades. They're EIP protocols. Right. So EIP uh, 1559 was a protocol that came out last year that does a burn on the transactions. Mm -hmm. If we get back into a bull market and the activity pulls up, Ethereum will become deflationary. Okay. So now that they're staking, so as we change from proof of work, we had all these miners using power but I can put my money now into a staking rig uh, and I can stake and it doesn't cost me a lot of power. You can stake on Coinbase, you can stake on Binance, lots of places you can stake. Okay, but now just I want to back you up there. Mm -hmm. Neil's more of an expert yep. uh, than, than, yep. than I am. So I, I know about staking. So if you want to be a validator, mm -hmm. you just have to have a stake in some cryptos in the staking pool. You have to have, if you want to be an individual validator, you need 32 ETH, which is about $70,000 to run one on your own. Okay. But you as an individual can go on Coinbase, you can go on Binance, or you could go to a protocol called Lido, and you can stake minimal amounts now. Okay. So, I mean, minimum as in there's, there's no minimum... Uh... Uh, within, within those protocols, it's minimal amounts, like, you know, 100 bucks, 50 bucks. But what's cool about it is that that stake return, mm -hmm. it's uncertain exactly what it's going to be. Some people may say it may go as high as 10% okay. uh, or 5 to 6. So with people looking for yield, you know, institutional groups, mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of people that will now understand about blockchain because they're going to pile in because they want to collect that 5%, 6%, maybe even higher annual yield. So it's the first part of the story is the, is the environment. Second part of the story is this, really, they're calling ultrasound money. It's the first time in the world we may have eventually deflationary currency plus right. staking. And then the third part is what we can build on top of it. We'll get to that in a sec. Wow, this is, this is amazing, you know, with so many things that are happening. Uh, does it make life simpler? Uh, for for the one who is already in it. So if if someone like 
Okay, so I, I have invested in Ethereum. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, what I've seen is that after the merger, uh, you know, the 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 value has dropped mm-hmm. from what it was yesterday mm-hmm. uh, at about the same time was about one thousand five hundred eighty nine dollars to right now it is at no yes sorry yesterday it was one thousand seven hundred forty three right now it's one five eight nine mm-hmm. it is it, it's lost value. Mm-hmm. The the ease of entry has become simpler from mm-hmm. what it was because mm-hmm. entry point has reduced. But then at the same time, does it make me feel that hey, this new change is probably shaking things up? Okay, the first thing you got to think about from the macro can I, not, I, I don't really right now we're talking more about technology, but from sure. a macroeconomic standpoint, with the central banks and quantitative tightening because of inflation, crypto just like stocks, they're all following the same path. So yeah. I wouldn't really say that it's really a. a it doesn't have as much to do with what's going with the tech mm-hmm. as it does the macro inflation factor. Okay. And they're trying to knock it down with interest rate hikes. So I wouldn't think about it too much on that. But this stage, it, it obviously the environment, the currency, everything else, but it sets the foundation of something that's really awesome. So right. Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum, came up with basically a group of stages. Mm-hmm. So it starts with the merge, then the next stage, but this foundation has to happen first before we can go with something called the surge. Okay. The surge is basically going to do something called sharding. Mm -hmm. To make it really simple, they take that big ledger, they split into 64 parts. Okay. And then they've got some companies, you've probably heard of Polygon, probably heard of Arbitrum, some of these other names. They roll those transactions up Mm -hmm. into a bunch of them and stick them together. It's called zero knowledge proofs, but really simply, they roll that up. What that will do is make the network 10,000 times faster and reduce the fees. Right. So that stage, ha- this has to happen for that to happen next. Makes sense. Then there's some other stages that come, the verge, the purge, and the sur- and the splurge, which are mainly just to make it less overhead to make it more efficient. But what makes it exciting is building stuff. But, but Link, in the situation with the merge happening, mm-hmm. um, are, are, does it really enable institutional investors to purchase that were previously unable to do so? They weren't necessarily previously unable. I think it's more their interest level. Um, now that they can get a yield, and get that return because like right now you go to like bonds u.s bonds are like three and a change in terms of returns other bonds around the world are less so for them everybody's chasing yield right now so it will definitely bring institutional players into that space for sure Mm -hmm. do do you think this provides less risk for people who want to purchase ethereum um i don't like to give financial advice i I try to stay away from that i mean i've got clients that hire me to do that and under certain you know rules and regulations i can talk about it um, but I, I, I think right now the biggest risk right now is the macro environment because if whether you're buying stocks, bonds, crypto, whatever, that's your biggest risk. Mm-hmm. But I think long term, if you're thinking investing long term, Ethereum, because of this, these next stages and what will be able to be built, will uh, are really amazing. So the two other things that we should definitely talk about are how did they pull it off? There's kind of an airplane analogy I can give you. It's really cool. Sure. And then the next one is what does this other stage mean, mm-hmm. right? Right. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure, like you mm-hmm. mentioned, that there are stages. So what was the thought behind it? Was it only the electrical consumption or was it something else also that could, like you mentioned, that, you know, take it to another level altogether? So the electrical consumption is part of it, right? Mm-hmm. But the second is scalability. So right. I'll give you an analogy on that and then I'll explain how they pulled it off. So... Back in the day, early 2000s, I was selling something called DS3s to big server companies, right? Okay, I haven't heard of those. So a DS3 is a 45 megabit internet connection. Okay. <laughs> How much oh. do you get on your phone right now? Uh, on the phone, on a, like what, 200, 300 maybe? Yeah. yeah. So back then, early 2000s, a server company would pay us $45,000 a month. No, that would have been astronomical. For that connection. Yeah. yeah. So that was one problem. Second, we didn't have cloud. So a company couldn't start up a brand new internet company. So instead, they'd have to have servers everywhere. Right. The third is we didn't have mobile connectivity. So all the apps didn't work. Makes we had sense. all the ideas. The dot-com bubble burst because every other idea is, but we couldn't pull it off. But they said the problem is scalability. Right. The biggest reason why people say that crypto is just currency and ha- can't do the other things that are really promised is because of scalability. Hmm. This, uh, the perfect analogy between Web2 going through that moment and me being there, and this next thing that Ethereum is about to roll out is where Web3 scales. And then that's where it gets like super exciting. I mean, there's a thousand use cases that happen. The other thing that's really cool is if we look at what happened with how they pulled it off. Mm-hmm. So in 2017, we were talking about ETH 2.0 and they were going to do all this at once. Mm-hmm. They realized that doesn't happen. But probably the single biggest engineering feat of cooperation in the world happened today. Okay. So if I went to Google and or, or my bank or one of these centralized entities, and they did a – as a centralized entity decide they're going to change out their accounting system or their engine, right? 
they'd probably stop the network, Obviously. turn it off, right? right? Same thing as on a plane analogy. You and I are flying a plane. We're going up the air, and we realize we need to change the engine. We're probably going to land the plane before we change it. Obviously. What Ethereum says, we don't want to turn down the network. So we're going to do it and basically replace the engine while it's still running in the air. And they didn't do it with one centralized company. They did it with thousands of decentralized companies around the world that came together to make it happen. Today will go down as we look in the future as the single biggest like cooperative engineering freak that's ever happened. And it went out without a hitch. It was amazing. Well, is, is that unfortunately part of the reason why it's flown under the radar so much? I, I think that like if you go into the crypto community, like uh, don't get me wrong, I mean Bloomberg, CNBC, every major radio show is covering it today. Right. Yeah. Like it, there, it, because and everybody before today were saying it's going to blow up, it's going to have problems, and they pulled it off. Um, but I think it's flown over the radar for mainstream people because these are really technical things. I, I I can speak a really high technical level with our technical teams on things when we're building things or consulting or within our software company, or we're you know I get asked to be a partner in different things. But I think one of the biggest problems we have right now is a lot of the people that speak the technical speak cannot lower it down to Makes where normal sense. people can use it. And I've grown up in the world of analogies because when I go talk to people back in the day in Web2, we had to get it to where True. people would understand it. Yeah, you can't explain to people what ones and zeros are. They, you know, <laughs> Obviously, yeah. I mean, Steve Jobs used to say, we have to tell people if they can speak on their headphones and their phone on the other side of the room can communicate. It's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, they don't man. really know the intricacies. And, and now we're dealing with magic internet, buddy. You yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, you, this is right because, see, for, for a common man to actually understand this, only once that understanding gets into the head, the usability will come into play. And then, uh, you know, one will be a part of this change that's happening, the cryptocurrency change that's happening. Uh, but how difficult is it for a common man to absorb this information? Because it is extremely technical. So I've been on a variety of different kinds of talks in like the last three days, right? Yeah. I've been on like countless Twitter spaces. And like the one I was on this morning, the countdown is a bunch of nerds. We're right. talking very high level super complicated and i was the main speaker and we're i'm helping a lot of them communicate and understand it right but then i i get involved i was on another twitter spaces where it was a very pe brand new people wanting to hear about cryptocurrency so for me i'll i'll completely take it down to the lowest level possible right today i think we got business users who are kind of somewhere in between but i think that we've got to learn to talk with those analogies and the other thing that we have to do is the scalability when the fees get lower is going to really help and when it gets sure. faster more applications will come that you'll use mm -hmm. things like identity so, for example, right now, you go log in with Google. You log in with Facebook. Right. Eventually, you'll log in with Ethereum. And by doing that, there's all sorts of different types of technology, different social media platforms that will get built. But it needs to scale, kind of like that Web2 analogy that I yeah, gave you with the DS3s. Until it gets cheaper, until it gets faster, they can't build it. But that's exactly what this next plan, uh, Vitalik Buterin's in-game plan is. It's a game change. But then there's a lot of things. Like, it's hard to use a wallet for new users. Right. How do I protect my private keys? Precisely. Um, I've been asked by a bunch of people to start a podcast recently. I don't know if I'm going to do it or not. I'm pretty busy with consulting and business. But to me, I think it would be really good for people to, like, you know, just explain to people how to set up a wallet, how to protect your private keys. And then... Mm -hmm take these really complicated things or you want to know the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin or Ethereum and Solana right, or yeah. what's Polygon. Being able to t create analogies and explain it to people in a way that they get is, I think, what the space is missing completely uh, right now. Look, uh, we are on TSB TalkSport Business here on Talk 100.3. We're currently speaking to Link Legrand from Legrand Holdings in regards to this uh, incredible situation today uh, where there has been Ethereum's massive software upgrade, their merge, if you want to put it. Uh, going back to what you were saying about those technicalities, do you think the element of the mainstream not getting involved is is protecting a lot of people why they're enjoying getting in at what is still an early adoption phase because it, it's so technical to understand for so many people. I, I think part of it is the technicalities. You know, a lot of these things don't have to be explained. So to me, it's really easy, man. It's an accounting reg ledger. Mm -hmm. So whether my bank has it, has it and, they, and they make the decision on how much money I have yeah. or whether it's Facebook with my accounts and says who are my friends are, or whether it's you know some other like Google and they I have my Gmail and they control it. The only difference is instead of one company handling it, now you've just got a bunch of different people that no one person can control it. But I, I think outside of that, you're right. It, it's incredibly complicated, and I just think that we need to do a lot better job of educating. But these, the the type of visibility that the merge got today, and the the really the scalability that's coming, I think will bring applications that will be better than what we have now and that's when people are going to want it. That, that's exactly my next question. For a common man who is probably not already in this wave, 
who probably has found this a little difficult to understand what are the use case scenarios which will become absolutely common on these platforms uh, would would it would it control our emails would it control our our social media would it mm-hmm. control my investments where is it where i will need to be a part of this uh, you know bubble that's blowing up right now okay so to answer that question i think we have to go back to what it does now right so bitcoin today a lot of people call it digital gold so its use case is a store of value right and whether you believe it goes up or down it has some volatility that's what it does Ethereum was the first smart contract network, yep. so the first one you could build stuff. The main use cases today are DeFi, people trading it, mm-hmm. and different types of applications, and mm-hmm. NFTs. Right. That's the main stuff. But where we're going, um, there's a, a recent application that came out called Lens. It's a social profile. Uh, it's a social media type application, but it's not ready yet. It's not fast enough. It's not mm-hmm. scalable enough. I believe that identity will be a big one. Okay. Um, you will create a decentralized identity that instead of logging in with Facebook or Google, you'll log in with your decentralized identity. Eventually, governments will probably adopt this. You'll be able to go check in for your, um, you know, setting up your passports. I think that down the road, we'll get to that. There's also a lot of use cases relating how you give funds and charity. Um, there's some really neat concepts with that. Next, I think there will be new types of social media. I, I can't talk too much about an idea, but one of the companies that I'm kind of involved in is working on something really cool with AI mm-hmm. that I think could really advance um, what we know to be social media. Mm-hmm. And then just think of anything where somebody keeps a record, whether it be your bank, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Google, all those things could get disrupted. But like we talked about at the beginning of the show, the the part about the DS3 example when $45,000 a month was what I would sell server companies for 45 megabits right. that you get on your phone probably 10 times that for pennies that wasn't scalable then the today was the first step towards blockchain making that big transition and over the next year or two Blockchain will start competing for a lot of these spaces. It's going to be really interesting. Link, it has been fantastic hearing your thoughts today. We could talk to you for an hour or so. I can see why you're getting approached to do some podcasts because your uh, your passion and your energy for this concept is uh, is overwhelming. So we know how busy being the significant day it is today uh, that you've been. So we do appreciate you. And thank you for coming in and speaking to us here on Talk 100.3. Absolutely, guys. Really enjoyed it. We'll do it again sometime soon. That's Absolutely. A, Link Legrand from Legrand Holdings uh, speaking to us. So if you uh, want to recapture any of that, because uh, there was a lot to go through in that 20 minutes, uh, you can get our podcast after the show here on TSB. TSB.